Section 9 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 9. The Foxhound. By Dr. M. G. Lazy. The article here proposed to be written on the foxhound will have special reference to the American hound, with which the writer has had a lifelong familiarity. Never having been in England, he has no personal familiarity with English packs, nor with English methods of training and hunting. He has seen many hounds imported from English packs run in this country, and has had the pleasure of hunting with gentlemen who have owned and hunted packs in England. His judgment of English hounds of modern packs is based on specimens he has seen run here. As to the ancient hounds of England, he knows the current statements of authors, which need scarcely be copiously extracted in this space. It may as well now be stated that the writer is not an Anglomaniac on the one hand, nor inspired by extravagant or irrational prejudice against that which is English on the other. There is much in the history of the English people so great and grand as to be beyond the reach of envy. There is much also which no one should be so great a fool as to be smatter with silly panegyric. There are many things admirable in England which are totally absurd and ridiculous in America. Out of England undoubtedly originally came all that is greatest and best in America, both men and things less than men. The old English hound seems to have been a large-boned, coarse, heavy animal, and the packs of those days must have caught very few foxes on fair terms. The earlier importations into America, far back in colonial days, were probably similar to the early English hounds. But in this country their character was soon changed, as it was also in England. In that country changes were attempted in the way of better adaptation to the modern chase by crossing with the greyhound and, to a small extent, with the pointer. In this country the change adaptive to the environment came about rather by unconscious selection and breeding from the best red fox hounds only. It soon came to be realized that in running down and killing an American red fox, main strength and awkwardness had no place. It was a matter of speed and bottom. The English mode of selecting the hound was based upon his suitability to a particular pack in size, color, tongue, and speed. A hound too fast for them was much out of place in the pack, and was a spoiler of their somewhat cut-and-dried notions of sport. The American method was based on the ability of the hound, as an individual, to kill a red fox on such ground as must be run over in this country, and the American pack was made up from such as could keep company with the leader. To breed a red fox pack, it was necessary to make the best dog with the best bitch, and this method led to the creation of a type peculiar to America, not modeled on size and tongue and color and questions of packing well, but a type modeled on speed, courage, and endurance. And the architect of the model was the American Red Fox, for in the language of a famous turfman, he it was who cut out the running and set the pace, and to beat him, the race had to be run from end to end. For a pack bred and put together on any other plan, the Red Fox chase resulted always in one and the same finale. That is to say, Reynard first, the rest nowhere. Precisely the principle of selection, breeding, and training, which produced our great four-milers on the turf, produced our red foxhounds. The formula is simple. That is to say, breed to the winners. Upon this principle the American foxhound shaped itself to the model most fit to do the work of killing the red fox, becoming lighter and more rangy in form, 
and shriller in tongue than its English ancestor. The bones, like those of the racehorse, became notably smaller and lighter, and at the same time more solid and stronger. The lungs also became more capacious and less encumbered with coarse inelastic tissue and fat. The muscular fiber finer and more effectively endowed with contractile power. The heart, the great central motor power of circulation, and the contractile muscular coats of the vessels themselves participating in the organic evolution along the same lines of development. Thus, in process of time, there came to be American packs capable of dealing with American red foxes on fair terms. The main architect and master builder of those packs was the American red fox, like that ill-fated eagle which furnished the feather that winged the arrow which pierced its own heart. The American red fox trained those packs which were eventually able to kill American red foxes. Without the fox, the packs would not have been produced. In England, doubtless, their hard and fast notions of the right make-up of a pack, and the stiff and rigid technicalities of the meat and hunt, have prevented in some degree that complete adaptation of means to ends which has been perfected with us. We have never been in love with pomp and vanities and stilted tomfooleries. Nevertheless, in England it began after a time to be seen that faster hounds must be had if any foxes were to be caught, and hence crosses were made to the greyhound, he having already been crossed to the bulldog, and the result has been more rangy, speedier, smaller, and fiercer hounds. To keep within the sound of such packs, moreover, the hunting horse of our great-grandfathers had to be replaced by one of more blood, more speed, more courage, more endurance, at the highest rate of speed, all of which points were covered at a stroke by more blood. Following this development, a new style of horsemanship was demanded and the English country gentleman is no dude on horseback. The style of the pert Newmarket jockey, imported, aped, and loved by American fashionable dudism rampant, is by no means the style of the English gentleman on horseback. The man capable of making a creditable exhibition on an English hunting field today must be a great horseman riding a great horse. Now the central force which gave to this evolution its initial impulse and has carried it forward to its acme of development is the speed and bottom of the english fox it is not to be disputed that the thing hunted determines all the details of the hunt if a man attacks a grizzly away back in some lonely canyon he will soon perceive that a winchester express is one of the modern details of the combat nicely adjusted to the fighting weight of Ursus Tiorribilis. In this view of the case, the red fox can claim a dignity which has not been accorded to him hitherto, the dignity of statesmanship as a producer of important national and international results. British horsemanship has played an important part on more than one great modern battlefield, mainly contributory to the highest type of British horsemanship has been the school of the hunting field. The best cavalry horses have been bred for and fallen somewhat short of the requirements of the hunting field. In America we have never had horses especially bred for hunting, and mainly for the reason that in those parts of the country where hunting was practicable, the saddle horses in common use by the country gentlemen were sufficiently well bred for hunters and were in fact commonly used in the chase. There was, indeed, that degree of attachment for his riding horse on the part of our country gentleman which disqualified every other horse in his eye. No person other than himself was ever permitted to mount his favorite, and he would not himself mount any other horse except under the stress of necessity. Thus it came to be that a more splendid horsemanship never characterized any people than that of the southern country gentry of the United States. The place of the foxhound 
in that civilization was not a low nor unimportant one in the school which developed the manly prowess and the saving common sense of such men as george washington and his great lieutenant the dashing light horse harry the red fox and red fox hound were not insignificant educational factors the hero sage of mount vernon maintained to the last of his life an unexcelled pack and he loved no diversion as he did fox hunting in which he never lost a chance to participate with his friends and neighbors the fairfaxes the lees the chichesters the mccarthys the masons and others no sport so well merits the position of a recognized national sport and none can ever be so greatly tributary to manly prowess and hardihood superior horsemanship is the most elegant and useful accomplishment ever possessed by a lady or gentleman one of the considerations favorable to fox hunting as a national sport is that it can be kept out of the hands of professionals and within reach of people of moderate means if the view be correct that the english and american red foxes respectively have developed the modes of the hunt and the characters of the packs in the two countries we must look for any material differences between the english and american hunt to the differences between the foxes of the two countries that in speed endurance and stratagem in front of the dangerous pack the american fox is greatest there is little doubt it follows that in speed bottom and trailing the american hound is superior to the english of this i have personally not the smallest doubt i have seen many imported hounds run in this country and they have been of undoubted excellence but never equal over our country to our best american strains this is in accordance with plain and simple common sense no doubt the english packs would excel ours on their own ground on all except speed i do not believe and i cannot be made to believe until it is done that the best pack in england can do anything at all whatever with an old virginia red fox it is not believed by many of the fox hunters of the northern states that any pack of hounds can catch their foxes i am too strongly impressed by what i know of the difference in the habits of the same species of wild animals in different localities to be willing to adopt an opinion adverse to the prevailing opinions of competent observers in localities with which i am not familiar nevertheless i suggest to our northern friends that they are not familiar with the speed of the packs in our best hunting country and that their mode of hunting by standing after the manner of deer driving and shooting the fox in front of the dog would soon utterly ruin our best packs i do not take part in the harsh criticisms of the northern method of hunting i have no doubt northern sportsmen enjoy their sport and enjoyment is the object of all sport i have no doubt but it is the only way to kill their foxes as they protest i do not think i could enjoy it myself i take it to be inferior to deer driving and i think that inferior to any field sport i have ever participated in de gustibus non every man to his liking until the matter is tested and the contrary established i shall believe that such a pack as a wild goose pack is reputed to be can kill red foxes anywhere on any ground fit to be run over by hounds the speed of the foxhound appears to be rather greater than the speed of the best racehorse there is however very little authentic information on this point i can state as a matter of experience in riding to hounds that i have never seen a horse that could keep pace with a good pack of hounds for a single mile across country i have seen only a few hounds which seemed nearly equal to a red fox in speed if the fox was at his best i have never seen a pack kill a red fox unless they could keep him hard pressed from start to finish and in general when i have seen kills i have thought the hounds had the advantage in bottom rather than in speed 
the fox is a gluttonous feeder and if full fed he is taken at great disadvantage i doubt if any pack can kill a good specimen of the red fox if in the pink of condition running on favorable ground as a general principle i think the fox has greater speed the hound rather greater endurance and they are so nearly matched in both respects that the issue of the chase is in a great degree a question of condition rough uneven ground is favorable to the fox and seldom indeed is one in good condition killed by a pack when the chase is over rough uneven country for a greater part of the distance if the premises here stated are accurate the conclusion follows that only a skilled huntsman who knows how to make the conditions favorable to the pack and to put the hounds in the very best condition for the race has any chance to make kills unless the fox has the misfortune to be gorged with carrion when the start is made or is in some other way sick or out of condition it appears to me therefore that some northern fox hunters have fallen into error as to the superiority of northern to southern foxes they have purchased dogs of well-known southern strains and upon their failure to kill the foxes of the north as handled by those who hunt on foot and very probably shoot the fox before the hounds conclude that these hounds are not able to catch their foxes the conclusion does not necessarily follow if a fox from maine were taken to virginia and put down before a red fox pack handled by skilful huntsmen would that be considered fair to the fox no more than it is fair to the southern hound to take him to maine and to be run by huntsmen who never saw a kill who deny that any hound can kill their foxes and that therefore the legitimate and only way to kill maine foxes is by standing on the runways and shooting them before slow hounds a great deal of acrimonious dispute has risen over this question between the fox hunters of the two sections which it has seemed to me that a little good temper and a little good sense might have prevented that some packs can and do make frequent kills in virginia and maryland of what seem perfect specimens of the red fox in seemingly good condition is a matter that is known to be true by all fox hunters of those states i am of opinion that south of virginia more kills are made because the ground is likely to be more favorable to the pack and less favorable to the fox and for no other reason it seems likely that in maine the ground may be so favorable to the fox and unfavorable to the hound that even if the chase were made to kill with hounds instead of shooting kills would be rare in the matter of breeding for a pack of red fox hounds the principles which govern the science of successfully breeding for any other purpose apply the inheritance must be through ancestors of known ability to kill red foxes and they must have gone through the training and practice which enable them to show by actual kills that they can kill no turfman would expect to breed a winner from a stallion and mare neither of which had ever been trained or raced no sportsman would expect to breed a setter or a pointer from untrained parents which would win a place at field trial no cocker would expect to win a main with cocks bred from birds which never fought why then should a huntsman expect to breed a killing pack of red fox hounds from stock that had never run or had never killed a fox the thing cannot be done therefore it goes without saying that a hound should not be bred from until fully matured trained and experienced in killing foxes something else is wanted besides a pedigree true enough a knowledge of not merely the names but the performances of the ancestors is essentially necessary and this is doubly and trebly true of the immediate progenitors if a bitch which has killed red foxes be bred to a hound that has killed red foxes the progeny will be born most likely capable of being developed into hounds capable of killing red foxes but it must be remembered that though orators and poets may be born 
not made a red fox killing pack has to be made they are not born able to do it they must be made able by judicious and skilled practice and training after being bred ripe nor can they be trained by a man who never rode to a killing pack if a man does not know how the thing is done how shall he teach the hounds by sheer force of hereditary instinct it would be more likely the hounds would kill in spite of the huntsman and show him the way to do it in this place we may profitably review the question of the best form and size of hound to be selected from which to breed a pack capable of dealing with a red fox the question to kill or not to kill a red fox is not as already hinted a question of main strength and awkwardness but of speed and endurance remember that the fox leads the chase and in a great number of cases outruns and outlasts hounds horses and men and simply runs away and leaves them this animal is but little more than a foot high and weighs not above twelve pounds in good running order the largest bone in his skeleton does not exceed the diameter of a goose quill the whole osseous frame weighs scarcely a pound it is quality not substance which lands reynard a winner it is the firm opinion of the writer that the best red fox dogs are not above medium size in height and weight the dog should not exceed twenty-three inches in height nor fifty-five pounds in weight the bitch less by about ten per cent hounds of this size will be fleeter and more enduring as a rule than larger and heavier animals and their shoulders and feet will suffer less from the tremendous concussion which they must bear in a protracted chase at such a pitch of speed as will be necessary for to kill a fox he must be put to his best from start to finish the head of the hound is rather small in proportion to his weight and the muzzle rather finer in the modern hound than in the older type the nose is large and the nostrils thin the eyes large bright and expressive placed rather close together and directed forward the stop is not as sharply defined as in some breeds a very important point and one much overlooked is that the jaws should be well spread at the angle so as to give ample room for the thrapple and to secure that easy amplitude of motion between the head and the neck so essential to carrying the scent at the tremendous speed of the chase the ears are longish but shorter and narrower than in old-time packs they are placed on the skull low down and are decidedly pendulous the leather is neither fine and papery to the feel nor by any means coarse harsh and inelastic the neck must be long and wholly free from any coarse loose flaps of thick skin or useless cellular tissue and fat the shoulders ought to be not only sloping but possessed of very free motion and yet powerfully muscled and strong the elbows ought to be well developed and well away from the body but placed perfectly true neither out nor in a hound with weak or badly formed shoulders is a deformed and crippled beast and can never be expected to amount to anything the forearm should be not too long but powerfully muscled and having sufficient clean fine bone to bear the weight thrown upon it by fifty-five pounds bounding at terrific speed the foot must be of firm texture and well padded the shape is a matter of less moment bench showmen to the contrary notwithstanding i have seen hounds that were great performers hounds that i have seen lead a great pack and pull down and kill numerous red foxes that would have been pronounced by these authorities defective in the feet perhaps ridiculed as splay-footed i have seen hounds with feet the form of which would have been pronounced perfect but which nevertheless were tender-footed and could by no means stand a desperate chase over rough ground i am not sure that the despised harefoot is not the best form for the hound giving him a better hold and purchase upon the ground 
and being in no way correlated with lack of hardness of the foot. The hound should be deep in the heart place, and the breastbone keel-shaped, but the breast must not be weak and contracted. The back ribs should spring off well from the backbone, and barrel out well, so as to give ample room for the heart, lungs, and great vascular trunks, for here is the ultimate source of power, speed, and endurance. The loin should be high, well arched, broad, and powerfully muscled, for here is the origin of a group of muscles of tremendous power, which are, with those of the hip and thigh, the main propellers which carry the body forward at so great a rate of speed. The tail should be placed nearly on a level with the sway of the back, though the arching of the loin and slope of the quarters somewhat deceives the eye, so as to make it appear to be set lower than is actually the case. The tail of the hound curves well upward. Recent importations, I think, too much so. It is stout, of moderate length, well-haired, and even with something like a brush in many superior specimens. I think it might be bred finer with advantage. The stifle is well bent, and the hock placed near the ground. But the leg, as compared with some breeds, rather straight, I think, in some cases a little too straight. It is upon the outlines suggested by these remarks that I would advise selections for the breeding stud. In the matter of color, we are fancy-free. The best hounds I ever knew were black and tan, and that is a beautiful color. The best hound I know of at present is a lemon and white. The so-called blue mottled hounds were beautiful. On a clear blue, not a black and white mixture, ground color were fancifully arranged spots of black yellow and white if the spot around either eye was blue or white that eye was blue the other eye being in a dark spot was dark or in a yellow spot yellow i have seen good hounds of solid yellow or yellow with white feet and a white streak in the face color may be to suit taste the standard by which foxhounds are judged at our bench shows as follows head fifteen elbows five neck five legs and feet twenty shoulders ten color and coat five chest and back ribs ten stern five back and loin ten symmetry five hind quarters ten totaling one hundred the head, value 15, should be a full size, but by no means heavy. Brow pronounced, but not high or sharp. There must be good length and breadth sufficient to give in the dog hound a girth in front of the ears of fully 16 inches. The nose should be long, four and one half inches, and wide with open nostrils, ears set low and lying close to the cheeks. The neck, value five, must be long and clean without the slightest throatiness. It should taper nicely from the shoulders to the head, and the upper outline should be slightly convex. The shoulders, value ten, should be long and well clothed with muscle, without being heavy, especially at the points. They must be well sloped, and the true arm between the front and the elbow must be long and muscular but free from fat or lumber. Chest and back ribs, value 10. The chest should girth over 30 inches in a 24-inch hound, and the back ribs must be very deep. The back and loin, value 10, must both be very muscular, run into each other without any contraction or nipping between them. The couples must be wide, even to raggedness, and there should be the very slightest arch in the loin, so as to be scarcely perceptible. The hind quarters, value 10, or propellers, are required to be very strong, and as endurance is even more consequence than speed, straight stifles are preferred to those much bent, as in the greyhound. Elbows, value 5, set quite straight and neither turned in nor out, are sine qua non. They must be well let down by means of the long true arm above mentioned. Legs and feet, value 20, 
every master of foxhounds insist on legs as straight as a post and a strong size of bone at the ankle being specially regarded as all-important the desire for straightness is i think carried to excess as the very straight leg soon knuckles over and this defect may almost always be seen more or less in old stallion hounds the bone cannot in my opinion be too large but i prefer a slight ankle at the knee to a perfectly straight line the feet in all cases should be round and cat-like with well-developed knuckles and strong horn which last is of the utmost importance the collar and coat value five are not regarded as very important so long as the former is a hound color and the latter is short dense hard and glossy hound colors are black tan and white black and white and the various pies compounded of white and the color of the hair and the badger or yellow or tan the stern value five is gently arched carried gaily over the back and slightly fringed with hair below the end should taper to a point the symmetry value five of the foxhound is considerable and what is called quality is highly regarded by all good judges the music of the pack is one of the greatest charms of the chase even the fox himself undoubtedly enjoys this glorious melody when running in front of a pack which is not dangerous and which with marvellous intuition he almost immediately realizes it always appeared to me that my father the keenest and most ardent fox hunter of his time in virginia enjoyed the music more than anything else about it he would put a good hound out of his kennel and give it away because as he said it did not chime with his pack he had a splendid ear a magnificent voice and a natural talent for music a discord was an agony to him and his pack was i believe the most melodious in tongue ever heard in virginia the qualities of the voice in the hound are strongly hereditary and may easily be bred for with success it is of the greatest importance that the dog should not be bred from until fully matured no animal is so easily injured by excessive or premature taxation of the procreative powers a dog of great value should be strictly limited to the best and most promising females for nothing is more certain than that the character of his progeny will begin to be disappointing as soon as he begins to be overtaxed the foxhound bitch is a very prolific animal on several occasions i have known them litter as many as twenty whelps thirteen whelps to a litter are nothing unusual i do not believe any bitch can properly care for more than six whelps if a foster mother cannot be had all above that number should be drowned not later than the day after they are born saving of course the most vigorous and prettily marked in all cases any appearing decidedly defective should be immediately drowned as has been already suggested the best dog should be mated with the best bitch without much regard to the question of kinship for hounds bear close inbreeding well if they are rationally managed in other respects as they are naturally pre-eminently hardy and free from constitutional diseases of a hereditary nature a strong prejudice against what is called incestuous matings is deeply implanted in the human mind but it is due rather to social considerations than to physiological data notwithstanding that persons most ignorant of physiology clench their arguments by the pet phrase physiology teaches so and so it is safe to say that physiology teaches nothing of the kind nor do such writers know anything whatever about what physiology teaches the natural laws of heredity transmission act upon the offspring in one and the same way whether the parents be near of kin or strangers in blood the kinship or non-kinship of parents near or remote does not in any respect or in any degree modify the laws of heredity affecting their progeny it is curious how hard people find it to get over preconceived notions my father repeatedly bred daughter to sire and produced in that way some of the finest hounds he ever had in his kennel i remember very well when 
on one occasion a friend of his who had repeatedly bred from full brother and sister said to him that he could not help thinking that to breed from daughter and sire was a little too close my father said why man you breed closer than that oh no said he i never bred closer than brother and sister and that don't hurt a bit well said my father the blood of brother and sister is as i understand the matter identical whereas the daughter has only half the blood of the sire and half the dam i think that you breed twice as close as i do this little analysis seemed to strike the man dumb it certainly does seem that way said he when you come to look at it but it always seemed to me that it was a heap closer to breed daughter to her own father than a brother to his own sister said my father with a laugh breed the best to the best is the best rule i know by which to breed red fox hounds a hound not capable of catching the red fox is of no value to the fox hunter ninety-nine out of one hundred of the hounds of the country cannot do it if the american hound is to be made what he should be it is time to begin at once to find out where any such hounds are as have been demonstrated by actual kills their fitness to be bred from it is of no use to bring english hounds here expecting them to be able to do anything with our foxes nor to expect to produce a killing pack by breeding from imported hounds i know at present one hound only bred even on one side the dams from an imported hound that is able to kill a red fox i have never seen an imported hound able to do it if killing packs are located by those ambitious to become owners of such hounds they must not expect to get them for a low price one hundred dollars would be only a moderate figure for a good hound i know many deer at a dollar per hundred no animal that lives is more worthless than a worthless hound a few thoughts and suggestions as to kennel management are now in order let everything in this line be simple natural as possible and inexpensive expensiveness means artificiality and that means a worthless pack a pack of hounds should associate together as much as is allowable with a minimum of restraint one good-sized building in the centre of a yard enclosed by a picket fence is the best arrangement there should be no floor except the ground and there should be an ordinary door to admit a man of full height without stooping also a good and well hung and latched gate to the yard and a lock on door and gate ordinarily the door should stand open and should be hooked to the side of the building to keep it open the floor must be kept littered with clean straw or shavings or in summer with green pine tags no trees near by when the hounds are kenneled at night or for any other purpose in the daytime take the couples off put the hounds in the yard lock the gate and allow them to go in and out of the house at pleasure after feeding in the morning put the couples on and let the hounds go out as they please do not couple puppies at all nor kennel them except at night at all seasons of the year let the pack out to follow the owner about as often as possible always uncoupled give puppies and young hounds the utmost liberty possible but never let them be out of the kennel at night whenever the hounds are wanted blow them up with a horn never punish them except it be necessary and then wail them soundly with a good whip thus a dog becomes more attached to his owner nor is more easily controlled by one who understands it some men do some men don't some men can some men can't the last three hounds i owned of the old blue mottled breed two dogs and a spade bitch were so attached to me that it was actually dangerous for anyone to suddenly approach me if they were nearby they were never coupled and only kenneled at night to prevent them from being suspected of mischief when the young hounds are about a year old they should be taken one or two at a time with one or two old hounds and taught to run 
if you take young ducks to the water they will swim and if you take young hounds well bred to the field they will run experience is all they want and this a man who knows how to hunt knows how to give them at first the old hounds will show the way and the inexperienced will follow at their heels but in no long time a youngster grown ambitious will push for the lead it is worth while to suggest that a very necessary adjunct to a breeding kennel is a dog-proof apartment with room enough for two for bitches in season this apartment must be such that no dog can by any possibility get in or out except through the door it must have a light floor or some dog is sure to dig under and get in in the matter of feeding variety is necessary no animal thrives well confined to one sort of food the hound is a large and most energetic animal and must be liberally fed it is the potential energy of the food which develops into the dynamic energy of speed and endurance it is the protoplasmic substance of food which is converted into muscle and nerve and the minerals of the ash of the food which are converted into bone by the marvellous workings of the animal economy the hound itself in its perfection the music of its tongue and the arrowy swiftness of its pace are neither less no more than the varied products of the vital metamorphoses of its food give it plenty it is greedy not without a cause give it variety for it has the same disgust for eternal sameness that you and i have give scraps from the table bread meat bones vegetables from the kitchen hot liquor and the varied offal which accumulates there meal ground of equal parts of rye oats and corn and baked in thick pones is a good working diet the dairy will furnish skim milk curds whey buttermilk bonny clabber when you butcher a beef or kill hogs unkennel the pack and let them gorge it delights and does them good bear in mind that we are trying to follow nature rather than a cut and dried artificial system this article is written from the standpoint of the country gentleman helping to make helpful suggestions to those who desire to adopt the fox hunt as the manliest and most invigorating the most delightful of sports of the field and to help to make it the national sport of america therefore those to whom the hunt is a mere fashionable fad will probably not find much to amuse and less to instruct them seeing that they know everything which is really so english don't you know it is hoped that the gentlemen of moderate means lovers of horse and hound will be encouraged to take up the sport and to maintain a pack which can be done at a very moderate expense if a gentleman be so situated that he can breed and train his own hunting horse i am sure he will take more pleasure in him than he could otherwise do all that is here recommended is the result of the rider's personal experience which has been a delight shooting and fishing have been so overdone that it is evident that what remains of them worth attention will be rapidly taken up and preserved by the exclusive and the wealthy the noble sport of fox hunting remains and will ever remain within reach of the people it can never be preserved it can neither be monopolized by professionalism nor ruined by records it is a sport in which ladies may and should freely participate and hence it can scarcely be vulgarized from an experience of thirty years in the medical profession the writer is of the opinion that there are fifty delicate women who would be physically regenerated by horseback exercise to one who would be in the least degree injured by it unless we become a nation of fox hunters we shall very surely become a nation of dog carters a multitude of arguments in favour of hunting suggest themselves 
it is difficult to find one valid argument of a contrary effect it remains to glance at the subject of the diseases of foxhounds if the rational system of kennel management be adopted and the hygiene of the kennel be attended to there will seldom be a sick hound they are of a race of animals naturally preeminently hardy the hygiene of the kennel consists in a few simple things let the kennel be clean dry light and warm let the hounds be out as much as possible but always kennel them at night if a neighbor has sheep killed by curs he cannot lay it to the hounds if they were locked up in the kennel when the hounds are let out they may be coupled and they should always be broken to the couple but should not be kept coupled merely from habit if they are not likely to get into mischief let them run loose the couple should be a stiff iron rod not over six inches long with an inch ring for the collar at each end if longer they are always liable to get hung up by all sorts of obstructions and are bent and twisted out of shape in the make-up of the pack i have found spade bitches to be desirable they are in no respect inferior to dogs and they are in every way more pleasant to handle being far less disposed to wander out of bounds or get into any kind of mischief the greatest couple of foxhounds i ever have known were litter sisters spayed when about two months old which is the best time to spay the operation is simple and safe and if performed prior to sexual development is not productive of the least tendency to obesity even in old age i have always believed that the instincts of spayed bitches if the operation precedes sexual development were like those of worker bees superior to the sexually developed individuals the most remarkable exhibition of nose i have ever seen both in the hound and in the setter or pointer as well as the field spaniel were by spayed bitches and the thing much in their favour is that they are much more patient than dogs or open bitches of kennel discipline and in my opinion at least less subject to disease this article must now be brought to a close if it shall aid in inducing lovers of the hound to act in concert to push the sport to the front as the recognized natural sport of the american country gentleman the object of the writer will have been accomplished if wealthy clubs of city gentlemen are disposed to join in the movement to americanize and nationalize this great sport they will find the country gentlemen ready to cooperate in every way that it is a matter of national importance in connection with the development of the american saddle horse and the american horsemanship of the future the writer does not doubt he pleads guilty to a rank enthusiasm for horse and hound and horn but he believes that he is not mistaken in supposing that unless fox hunting becomes our national sport our national horsemanship will dwindle until it amounts to nothing and all our people will take to dog-carts whether this will be a national calamity there ought not to be two opinions end of section nine recording by william jones